tonight on JM on Cars. Oh, God. Oh, the water is coming in now. Oh, dear. Oh, oh no. Da, da, oh, oh, right. Oh, now, now I'm getting the wet foot. But also... meat and potatoes. Who could fail to fall in love with the combination of a lightweight chassis and a dirty great big American V8 engine? That is the recipe that has kept the AC Cobra and its many spin-offs popular for the last six decades. But what I'm driving today, despite appearances, I am told by its makers, is not a Cobra at all. So then, what exactly is it? What makes it different? Does it matter? And is it any good? Let's find out. For expediency's sake, let's just for a minute lump this in with all of the other Cobra replicas. And if you're like myself, you are probably somewhat confused by the sheer quantity of them out there. You have cars from the likes of Hawk, AK, Dax, Superformance, and I'm sure a whole bunch of others. Nearly all of them seem to follow the same formula laid down by the original car. In other words, a body often based on the 427 Cobra, that's the one with the nice big beefy arches and a thumping great big engine up front. Today, very often a Chevrolet small block LS, which I know to some may be considered automotive sacrilege, but in very many ways that is the engine currently available which most suits the character of the original Fords. I have previously driven a number of Cobra replicas both on and off camera and generally speaking had a great time in each and every single one of them. But this one has a couple of differences. First off, and I'm sure most obvious to you, is the fact it's wearing this hard top. It's not a coupe and they did build a Cobra coupe of which Superformance still make a continuation example. However, this is simply a regular Cobra looking car with the roof plonked on top. And uh, considering the fact the weather today is a little bit mixed, I thought it would be a good idea to keep it on. And it also was a chance to experience this car in this configuration. It has helped in terms of keeping me dry, but it hasn't really made it a much quieter experience. So I am very, very sorry to all those of you currently watching this with headphones in. I'm doing my best. I'm actually potentially convinced that it might be even worse in terms of wind noise on account of the roof, but uh, who can say? So this car is made by a company called Gardner Douglas. They are based just outside of Grantham in Lincolnshire, not too far away from the town of Melton Mowbray, famous for its pork pies. And that's actually where I'm headed now, though sadly not for a pork pie, because I have work to do. Not only am I driving this today, but I'll also later be taking out an example of their Lola T70 inspired car and also talking to them about a few exciting things they have in the pipeline. They gave me a little tour of their workshop this morning and showed me through some of the company's products. They began many moons ago, back in the 1980s. Founded essentially by a lovely chap called Andy Burrows, he began by building what's known as the Mark III. That was an evocation of the Mark III AC, and in terms of styling, it is very close to that car. However, it's underneath where the differences are to be found, because his version featured an entirely different chassis. A heavily triangulated steel space frame with double wishbone suspension up front and originally a Jaguar independent rear at the back, which was a very popular option for kit car builders at the time. 
In 1990, the company became formally known as Gardner Douglas, a name which it bears to this day. The car itself then evolved and gained double wishbone suspension at the rear to match that at the front. The engine options also evolved. Originally, the car had a Rover V8, then it went through a number of different options from Ford, and today, the most popular option is the Chevrolet Small Block. And that's what we have here. It's an LS3, which for those of you like myself who don't understand American engine codes, is the 6.2 litre version of the Chevrolet LS and in standard trim I think it puts out 450 horsepower or so don't quote me on that more importantly though thanks to a Lingenfelter cam upgrade and a set of eight individual throttle bodies it now puts out 520 horsepower and that is in a car which weighs less than a ton so the performance is spicy the gearbox is a Magnum six-speed made by Tremec and at the rear, you have a limited slip differential. What I'm driving today is known as their Mark IV, and visually, it's much closer to that of the later 427 Cobras. The moulding itself is actually taken from a carbon fibre race car built by AC themselves in the late 1990s. The mould was then acquired by Gardner Douglas, and if you are feeling fruity, you can actually get them to make you an all-carbon version of this too. unsurprisingly for a car that weighs naff all and has plenty of both power and torque it is very very eager yet still controllable at the back you'll find 275 wide tires and that is one of the benefits you'll get with the slightly wider chassis I have to say this morning I was really impressed not just by the friendly family atmosphere that the guys and girls at Gardner Douglas have created but also not just the quantity but also quality of the work that they are doing both chassis and bodies are constructed on site and I'll lay over a few shots of the chassis work now and you can see exactly just what it is that they're doing and yes yes great yes this is oh where's the where's the wipers there we go. Well, at least I now feel vindicated for having left the roof on. And it is at this point where I should probably tell you that, like just about all cars in this class, the GD427, as it is known, but not an AC and not a Cobra, does not have ABS, traction or stability control. In fact, it doesn't even have a brake servo. Nor does it have power steering. They're very, very trusting, as is this car's owner, a lovely chap by the name of Steve, who had it commissioned a couple of years ago with a very interesting brief. He wanted to be able to run the car on E20 fuel, that is, unleaded, which contains up to 20% of ethanol, compared to the 10% of our current unleaded and up to 5% of current super unleaded. I was told that achieving this wasn't actually all that difficult. The major work to be done was in terms of programming, because the car's ECU had to be set up to accept the fuel, which is somewhat less energy dense than that you'd get in E10 or E5. The rest of it, though, was essentially already set up to take it out of the box, and that, I think, is really handy to know. It also shows you the kind of stuff that Gardner Douglas can do. They produce in the region of about 20 to 25 cars a year, and in total have made some 600 or so ever. Not a massive business there, but the benefit of that is that you can have essentially whatever you want done. Of course, that's all well and good, but if, like myself, you're looking at this and going, yeah, okay, it still looks like a Cobra to me, you'll be thinking, what's the difference? And so I asked Andy that very question, and he said the idea of the Gardner Douglas is that we want it to not feel like a kit car. You can buy these in either kit or factory built form, but presently some 80% of them are the former. Naturally, there is a big saving for doing it yourself, and they estimate you could get a car up and running for between 40 and 50,000 pounds, depending on what suspension and engine combination you want to use. Factory builds, meanwhile, are closer to about 85,000 pounds and beyond. This particular example, I think, was just over 100. And that's a lot. A heck of a lot. But I have to say, it does actually seem to be meeting the brief. Oh, what a day I've picked. We delayed by a whole day to try and avoid all of this. 
And so now you're going to get a free bonus video. Can JM drive a 520 horsepower car with no driver aids whatsoever that weighs less than a ton and have fun and live? If you see this video, it means that I survived. Ah, oh God. Oh, the water is coming in now. Oh dear, oh no, da, da, oh, oh right. It was dry back that way, so I'm gonna turn around. That's, this is not good. This, oh, I think, no, I think it's brightening up actually. Oh, but if I turn around, I'm gonna go back through the weather. Oh, I'm so sorry everyone at home watching. I don't know whether you're gonna be enjoying this or not. If you are, please comment down below because it'll make it all worth it. And uh, actually the road here doesn't appear to be too damp. So uh, shall I back off a little bit and show you how quick this thing is? Yeah, we've got a straight here. So I'm in fourth doing like 1600 RPM and we're doing 40. Put down 50, 60. It's fast. <laughs> yeah doesn't feel it either feels really controllable really nice now there are some quirks about this car because it's got an original style wooden wheel it's very very close to the door here i was worried about my knuckles cracking into it but they haven't thus far there is adjustment in terms of both the pedals which go forwards and backwards the seat which goes forwards and backwards and also the steering wheel which goes up and down so the car will actually quite happily accommodate a good variety of different drivers this is quite good. Yeah, I do feel pretty heroic in this, it must be said. You've got that classic view out in the front, those big pronounced haunches at the side, that bonnet scoop in the middle, which is something that the original ACs would not have had, certainly the Mark III's. And it's relatively comfortable. It's pleasant in here. I'm having a pretty darn good time, it must be said. Damp knee aside. Special mention should also be given to these seats, which are really comfortable and very, very pleasant. They offered me a Gardner Douglas branded cap earlier. I think I'm going to go back and ask if they got a Gardner Douglas branded towel instead. Hey, anyone want to take guesses on the turning circle? Because it's not very good. Ah, ah, oh, crikey. See, one thing I really love about the Cobra and the GT40 replicas is the for some reason, they are the one car where you look at it and you kind of know it's a replica. If I had a real Cobra or real GT40, I don't think I'd be at all worried about driving it about the place because everyone would look at it and assume it's not a real one. And that doesn't really seem to bother anyone. And maybe that's because they've just got to a point where the originals are so rare, so valuable and everything. They've essentially nearly all been tucked away. They're in museums. and. That's a shame. A few very, very brave people do race them at the likes of Goodwood, and uh, I salute those people. The lights work, which is nice. This actually even has some LEDs on it, and the rear fog light from a McLaren. Oh, this is just rubbish. So, given the conditions, what can I tell you that's useful? Okay, first off, I want to talk about this gear shift. It's really light and a beautiful action. Really short throw. The phrase rifle bolt is thrown around a lot. I think in many cases by people that have ever actually used a rifle bolt. This is a rifle bolt gear shift. It's got that beautiful mechanical notchiness so you know exactly what you're doing at all points in time. Match that to the instant response of the throttle and it's wondrous. Then, with the six ratios, it's geared long enough that I'm doing 60 mile an hour now and just 1600 RPM. You can get this with little side screen inserts, which I sort of half wish I'd asked for now, but um, that will improve things. Ah, that will improve things a little bit, and uh, you could do big journeys with this car. Not only is it really surprisingly comfortable and supple, but like I mentioned, the engine doesn't rev, nor does it really annoy you. The volume in this, I think, is just about perfect. A lot of these are just daft loud. This is not. Still has cats and everything. It's all fully legit and legal. The brakes have Paget's blue pads on them, and they are a little bit of a weakness. Very wooden initially. I'm told they do improve with usage, but in these conditions, I'm unlikely to get that much heat into them. Very upset that I'm not really able to drive this car properly because I think on a dry day it would be absolutely mega. I put my foot down a little bit at the start of the review, which 
unfortunately for me, was genuinely the first time I'd driven this car beyond moving it in the car park, and it felt good, I have to say. Anyway, throttle, already mentioned, that's beautiful, linear, really easy to modulate, very, very nice, and the engine's just got power all the time. The red line is, well, I don't know, because there isn't one here, but I imagine it's probably around the sort of six to six and a half thousand mark. That's typical for these engines. Clutch is really friendly, very nice. And yeah, that ride quality, so, so nice, this thing. These guys have been working on this chassis for a very, very long time. They were telling me earlier that much of the advancement made over the last couple of decades isn't really in terms of the design of the thing, but in terms of the materials and manufacturing techniques. So nowadays they're able to order stuff in smaller quantities, make it in a more precise and accurate way. And they've also moved to the likes of CAD so they can design parts on computer rather than on paper, just making the whole process that little bit more efficient. Considering we've got the hard top on, the car is also really surprisingly free of squeaks, creaks, rattles and the like. In terms of their stated goal, i.e. making it feel not like a kid car, I'm really impressed. They were even showing me how in some of their base options, which have a gel coat rather than a paint. This one, incidentally, is actually not black. I know it might look like that, but it's a real sort of deep purple that when the sun hits it, is spectacular. Oh, now, now I'm getting a wet foot. Water is somehow getting in down there. Don't know how, but it's worked its way into my socks. Ah! And yes, on the gel coat cars, which you can have with the stripe, they were showing me how the stripe itself is actually essentially baked into the structure. So it's really precise every single time looks very good. They do supply a lot of these to customers who use them primarily on track days or for racing, where they can compete in a number of historic and replica series. Those customers really do like the gel coats because they are far more resilient to damage than the paint. They even show me very proudly how over the years they've managed to develop a number of techniques so that they can fix customers' cars without unnecessary expense. It is also worth giving a mention to the underlying technology beneath this car. No, it's not particularly radical, it's not a carbon fibre tarp or anything, but it is very, very clear that the safety and integrity of these cars is important to the people who build them. So you have that very triangulated chassis that, by their own admission, they could probably get lighter, but at a cost i.e. safety, and they just don't want to do that. Likewise, the body itself actually has a sort of sandwich material in the base, and the side of it is also filled with foam, which makes it not just a little bit more refined, but also safer too. Compared with the ladder chassis of the original Cobra, that means this should not just be a superior performer, but also lighter and safer too. You even have the added benefit of being able to get the seats a little bit lower, so really, it's a win all round. Later, after I completed filming with the T70, I had a second chance with the 427 in much more favourable conditions. With a dry road below me, I was able to put my foot down and was impressed not just by how quick the car was, but also how easy it made maintaining a good pace on tight and twisty country roads. The Cobra may have a reputation amongst some as being an unsophisticated muscle car, winning races only through its sheer might, but that's not at all how this one felt. It was agile and nimble, but most surprisingly delicate. All of the controls matched well in terms of weighting, something even big manufacturers can get wrong. The steering feel was good, but in truth it only ever felt like you needed to just guide the car with the gentlest of inputs, it's simply following your thoughts. On the right day, I struggle to imagine many other cars that have put a bigger smile on your face regardless of whether you're pottering through town or giving it the absolute big one. Of course, point to point, a whole host of more modern machinery will still ultimately be faster, everything from a Golf R to a McLaren 600 LT, but for me, this still has more than ample performance to impress and a chassis that is not punishing for inexperienced or casual drivers. The car even has a really decent sized boot, which currently has the owner's toolkit in it, which he keeps in a case for shotgun shells. That's the best, isn't it? Andy was also keen to point out that their construction method uses a rubber mounting between the chassis and body. This provides two functions, first an improvement in NVH, but secondly to give an air gap so that the chassis can breathe, thereby significantly reducing the potential for corrosion. 
Though I can imagine there will always be a market for tool room copies, i.e. exact replicas, both visually and mechanically, of the likes of the Cobra, for me, if you're going to go get a replica, why don't take the opportunity to improve on the original? Get a little bit of at least 1990s, if not 21st century technology in it. And though my experience of these things is very limited, I've driven different cars in different locations, definitely on different days. So I couldn't, in any degree of honesty, tell you that the GD is the best of the lot. I can tell you it's a really, really very good car that appears well made to a very high standard of both fit, finish and specification. It'll go like a stabbed rat, provided you're brave enough to put your foot down. Ah, oh, that's nice. And no, it isn't going to be cheap. £9,500, that's a lot of money. But if you were to think of it another way, it's the same as an M3 or a base 911. And you're just not going to get the same type of thrills from one of those as you would from one of these. So uh, from me, the GD gets a thumbs up. I like it and I like them. I want to say a big thanks to the team there for inviting me out and also to David, who if he's watching, knows who he is and has organized today. Lastly, but of course not least, thanks to all of you at home for watching and putting up with what has no doubt been a slightly technically iffy video. But uh, I really appreciate you sticking with it and don't forget, hit the like button, comment down below and if you haven't subscribed already, please do.